Good, good morning, everyone. My name is Maggie, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event, Storytime with Cinco Paul and Gladys Jose, presenting Clayton Parker Really, Really Has to Pee. We're so excited and grateful that our community, that, that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at Booksoup. Our next event is Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, August 31st, with Francine Rodriguez discussing a woman's story. Support our bookstores and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book, of this morning's featured book. Uh, just click, click on the green purchase button that reads Clayton Parker really, really has to pee directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We're also selling digital uh, audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. If you'd like a question, ask a, if you'd like to ask a question during the event, please click the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen and type it in. We do not use the sidebar to ask a question. Um, so a little more about Cinco Paul. Cinco has written screenplays for many films, including Bubble Boy, Dr. Seuss's Horton Hears a Who, Despicable Me, Dr. Seuss's The Lorax, Despicable Me 2, The Secret Life of Pets, and Despicable Me 3. Um, he's also the creator, executive producer, and songwriter for the 2021 Apple TV musical comedy series, Schmigadoon. Uh, a little more about Gladys. Uh, she's an illustrator and a storyteller. She graduated from the University of Central Florida in 2012, where she earned a bachelor's in fine arts degree specializing in graphic design. Uh, she is the illustrator of Fresh Princess, the Elephant's Hide and Seek Handbook, as well as a chapter book series for the Epic for Epic Books. She's worked with Scholastic Book Bears, Tangerine Press, and Sundance Graphics, and many others. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Cinco and Gladys. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Gladys. How's everyone doing today? I mean, you can't answer, so everyone, how are you, Cinco? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I thought I'd start off by reading a bit of the book. How's that sound? Okay. Look at, you can see Gladys's amazing illustrations. Are they are they reversed for you? No, it's, it's good. Oh, it's good. it adjusts it when you guys did it. Okay. So here I'm going to read the first part of Clayton Parker, really, really, really has to pee. A boy named Clayton Parker from the town of Mountain View was on a field trip headed for the San Francisco Zoo. He hoped to see a tiger, a giraffe, a chimpanzee. But Clayton Parker really, really, really had to pee. Thank you, Gladys. The morning of the field trip, Clayton's teacher, Mrs. Howe, said, if you have to go, my friends, the time to go is now. But Clayton didn't have to go. He honestly did not. And so he got onto the bus without a second thought. But as the bus was bouncing up and down and to and fro, poor Clayton felt that old familiar pressure down below. Oh no, he thought, is that, am I, I mean, but could it be? Yes, Clayton Parker really, really, really had to pee. See, when you drink some juice, let's say, once it has left your mouth, it goes down your esophagus and keeps on heading south. It passes through your stomach and your kidneys, and then soon it fills your bladder up with urine, just like a balloon. And then your bladder sends a message way up to your brain that says, hey there, I'm filled with all the pee I can contain. But Clayton didn't want a lesson in biology. He only knew he really, really, really had to pee. And then at last the bus arrived. They'd made it to the zoo. And little Clayton Parker knew just what he had to do. He had to find a restroom and he had to find one fast because he wasn't certain how much longer he could last. He didn't want to end up like a boy named David France, who years ago, in front of all the school, had peed his pants. No, Clayton didn't want to make that kind of history. But here's the thing. He really, really, really had to pee. The school kids all got off the bus and formed a single line while Clayton started looking for that magic restroom sign. 
He saw one, so he ran to it, forgetting all his cares, until he saw another sign which read, Closed for repairs. The agony that Clayton felt. He yearned to urinate. He wondered, am I doomed to suffer David Francis' fate? He joined a tour and followed it and saw what he could see. But Clayton Parker really, really, really had to pee. He spied a clump of bushes and he wondered, do I dare? Should I hide out behind them and relieve my burden there? He started to attempt just that, but then to his surprise, the bushes sprouted feet and legs and wings and plumes and eyes. He ran away in deep despair, his bladder about to burst. Would Clayton ever find relief or was the boy just cursed? And that's where I'm going to stop on that cliffhanger. That's What's a good cliffhanger. To poor, to poor Clayton. We don't know. You have to get the book to find mm -hmm. out. And now I think I'll turn over some time to Gladys, who I believe has a demonstration for us. Of yes. Her um, illustration skills. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you guys how I drew or illustrated Clayton Parker. Um, I use a program on the, on my iPad. I was going to do this live, but I didn't want to have any like mishaps with connection. So I recorded it and I'm just going to kind of talk through it. Um, here I'm drawing a circle. Um, even professional artists cannot draw perfect circles. So I had to go around multiple times until I felt happy. Um, and then I start kind of right drawing out guides. Um, so I can figure out where I'm going to place Clayton Parker's features and to make sure that I line them up correctly. Um, mind you, I don't normally draw this fast. Like I did this in 15 minutes because we were short in time. So normally I would take a little longer and make sure everything's super perfect. Um, so just ignore any, you'll see, any little mishaps I have. Um, here I'm drawing his eyes, his nose, and I wasn't sure what expression I was going to give him here yet. Um, so I just did a little slanted, like nervous expression. And here, as you see, I changed my mind and I'm like, let me exaggerate it a little further. Just adding his teeth, his eyes. Again, not trying to draw this perfect. Normally when I'm working on a picture book for a client, I will do this face on my own. Like no one will see this stuff. So you guys are getting an exclusive view of my first round of sketches. Um, but I'll like, after I have a good sketch, I'll like redo it, clean it up and then send it to the publisher. And that's when other people see it. Um, but yeah, so just trying to give you guys a, a rough idea of what it's like to draw Clayton or to draw in general. I love it story. is a lot easier when I already have a character design. Normally, if I'm working on different, if I'm trying to figure out a character, I won't take it this far right away. I'll come up with like really small thumbnails just to see if there's a silhouette that calls to me. But I already knew Clayton, I've known him for a year, so. And um, you, you guys just saw me fixing his jawline. Um, I made it too, too long. So again, like I said, and here I'm fixing the eye because I made it too low. But this is just a sketching phase. It's just really rough just to get something down. Here I'm getting ready to draw his body. Thankfully in picture books, I don't have to stick with actual human proportions. So his head's extra big. I did learn how to draw in proportion in college and in university and stuff. And my art teachers probably look at me and shake their head because I like I stylized my illustration style. And here you'll see I completely messed up the arm. Like it's just way too long for, so it's like, 
it's not in proportion to actual humans, but it's in proportion to my style. So I had to fix it and you'll see me fix it in a couple of seconds where I was like, wait, that's way too long. So I like cut it down a bit. Hands, I don't care who tells you that they've been drawing for 10 years. We all struggle with hands and fingers and that's okay. Um, you'll see that I fix it a bit later. And I think, yeah. And then here I'm just adding like a few final touches. Okay. And at this point, I normally take the sketch. I'll bring the opacity. That's the uh, um, the opacity. I'll bring it down. I don't know another word for opacity. So, Cinco, you're the words man. Great word. Um, <laughs> so I'll I bring it down and I start adding the flat colors. I'm not going to take you guys through my entire process today because we would be here all day. And I know you guys have things to do on the weekend. Um, but here, I'm just going to take it as far as putting down the flat art. Um, yeah. And you'll see here, I try to fix that extra long pinky. It's nice one hand is in his pocket, so you don't have to worry about that one. You caught me, you weren't supposed to. Oh. So, yeah. No, 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 it's okay. There's a lot of um, early on when I was illustrating and trying to figure out hands, I would hide the hands and pockets. And that is something that a lot of artists do. So in this case, I was like, I wish you one hand. Yeah. The other hand is. <laughs> to me, it makes sense. The character would have a hand in his pocket. Yeah. Um, right here. So when i'm designing a character i go through different palettes to try and figure out um the color of their skin their hair their clothes um clayton fun fact was just very like i think it was the first color palette that i tried was it like mm -hmm. he just kind of spoke to me and i instantly knew how he was going to dress what colors he was going to wear um his hair i don't know why I went with this hairstyle. I just wanted it to be very whimsical and big, but not centered and not perfect because Clayton isn't. Um, just wanted to make it fun. Yeah, it's great. I love his hair. It's crazy. Yeah. I think the initial sketch, I had it a little lower. And then I did a second round and I just went, I was like, okay, let me, let me not even think about it. And I just did the four loops and that was, it. I was like, okay, this is, this is Clayton. <laughs> You have to be good at coloring within the lines. Sometimes I, there are artists that don't, and that's great, and it's in their style for me. Um, I've always colored inside the lines. So, but it, it's hard with some brushes. I don't think, I did mess up on one of on one of his fingers or I colored outside the line, but I left it. But normally I would clean it out.
How long does it take you to do like one page of the book? Um, a, a long time because there's like different faces. So I have to make a thumbnail or I, I'll make like a few thumbnails to get the layout right. Like, let me see. Um, I think this one, I, at first I had it with the bus facing forward and I did a little thumbnail of that. Then I had one where they were in the, in the classroom and you saw the bus on the like outside um but then like further reading the text and trying to get everything kind of flowing together because it says that he's getting on the bus um i ended up with that sketch but then i had to resketch the characters because at that point i only had stick figures mm. so just getting it to a face to send to the publisher took me a solid for that one sketch maybe like a solid half day a full work day right. um just to get it really really like good um and then coloring that's a whole nother phase because what you what you're seeing now is just one character and done very like quickly um i have um started working a little faster compared to how i colored when i first started but it's been 10 years so it's expected. Um, so if there's an artist watching this and you are looking at this and you think this is fast, this is 10 years worth of working towards this. Um, so it, it takes time, it varies also. Yeah. I think we're getting to the end, almost. Yeah, I'm looking at his features. Well, the end of this phase, because I also, I didn't do the, the next part. I'll add shadows, highlights, um, other details. I like adding texture to illustrations so that, I don't know if it's reading, there's yeah. a that gloss, but I, I like, I, I don't like my art to look too, too flat. Um, So that's like a whole other one hour video. You guys can join in. Next yeah. week. I'm kidding. There's no next week. Um. <laughs> well, that was part of the appeal for me when they sent me a bunch of your illustrations and most of them were of animals, you know, in sort of really interesting, fun situations. But it was the, yeah, the dimension of it, right? And the mm -hmm. and it wasn't so flat and it felt... Not that there's anything flat. wrong with flat either. Yeah. But, but thank you. <laughs> Yeah, um, and also for artists, styles take a long time to like develop. So if you look at work I did 10 years ago, that probably took even like twice as long to create. It's morphed into what it is now. Um, I've also learned sometimes I was doing extra stuff for no reason at all. So I would kind of just cut stuff out. Um, so I think like the animal illustrations you probably saw were two years before Clayton. And even from there to Clayton, I switched up a little bit. You gotta be constantly evolving. You don't yeah. wanna stay the same. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's hard because I feel like I, in the first five, six years, I evolved like really quickly. I kept, I kept like just, you know, I go left and I'm like, no, no, I'm doing this and I'm doing it this way. Um, but I think that's every artist when they're starting off, they're trying to figure themselves out. I think he's Clayton, coming to life. what he's coming to life. Yeah. Yeah. I think at this point I'm putting down, so you see how his shirt, wherever the same color is hitting, you don't see the line where his sleeve and his shirt would meet. So I think we're getting to the step where I start adding those details. Um, yes, we're about to witness the end. Um, so yeah, so here I'll just pick like a, no, normally I pick very specific colors, but I just went with gray just for the video, but I'll start throwing down lines just to add details. So now you see that he has a sleeve and where are the arms curving, which the arm is still too short. Ugh. 
I think I'm adding detail on the collar mm -hmm. and his hair. Oh, Just yeah. a bunch of little happy loops. This is and so much more interesting than the video would be of me writing. <laughs> well, I was a little nervous because this is very quiet. And I mean, writing and illustrating, it's a very quiet personal process, right? You can't really have too much noise going on. Um, I mean, when I get to this space with illustrating, I do play music. But even when I'm coming up with the initial ideas and thumbnails, I'm reading your words and I have to have everything silent too. Cause now I have to get kind of like into your, the into the brain space that you were in and then extract from there, the visuals. Huh. So it's, it's a very quiet process, <laughs> but okay. Let me, I think we said exit out of that. Yeah. So we're oh. good. Thank you for watching that you guys. Yeah, that was great. That was amazing. Very cool. Um, all right. I don't know what else to say. If should we go straight to Q and A now? Or, I think so. Yeah. I think that's it. I can say that Clayton Parker and I have the same initials because this is based a little bit on uh, an experience I had when I was in oh. the fourth, when I was in the fourth grade. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. And mine mine ended up more disastrously than Clayton's, but we don't need to really go into the details. I mean, do we? We could. <laughs> we could. We, we have could, time. But it's probably yeah, we've probably run out of time for that. So maybe yeah. let, we should do Q and A. Yeah. Or... I think Maggie was gonna jump back on. Yeah, she's it looks like one person asked a question. Thank heavens. I have lots of questions I can just ask Gladys too. Me too. <laughs> Hi, I usually come on at the end, but I do have a question. Um, okay. Are there gonna be more Clayton Parker stories? Hmm. I don't know. I had never conceived of it as a series, but there could be other things that he really, really has to do that he doesn't want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would, would be embarrassing for him, so. Hmm, Gladys, maybe you and I should, we should we'll brainstorm. Brainstorm, yeah. yeah. It's, I think it's a very interesting way to navigate uh, discomfort in a child's world that also mm -hmm. translates very much over to an adult world. But what's so different is that with children, they always have to ask for permission to go to the bathroom, to you know, do whatever, and we don't. So it is a, lo a story a lot about power too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, my the story that this, you know, my life experience that this is based on was the teacher left the classroom to run an errand and said, nobody leave your desks till I come back. And she was gone for like a long time, <laughs> really longer than she expected. And I really, really had to go. But I was a good, obedient boy. I didn't want to get in trouble. So oh. So that's it. Led to disaster. Oh <laughs> disaster no! End as a result, yeah. Oh. So sorry to relate that, but um, I've recovered since then. Okay. Well, so, I mean, I'm sure writing Clayton Parker really, really has to be what's therapeutic for you, in a yeah, sense, right? It, it helped me address, you know, uh, face those those fears and the trauma, yeah. and uh, yeah. Um, I think that like like natural body trauma is like such an interesting. Like, you know, like when you get your first really bad headache, you know, and it's like you can't, like, at least for me, I get migraines, like you can't separate yourself because it's in your head. It's not like having your arm hurt, your leg hurt. So like these like first times for every like discomfort would be, I think I would love to see more of Clayton Parker. Oh yeah. yeah. In these moments. Sounds good. <laughs> well, I'll leave you more to Q and A, but I just wanted to chime in. <laughs> Yeah. So do you want us to go ahead and, okay. Are there, okay, so that was your question. Um. So I have a question for you, Cinco. Okay. Um. So I, I explained my writing, my illustrating process. What's your writing process? How did, 
you decide to create this story aside from your personal experience? Yeah, I, I think it did have to, I mean, you think as a writer, you often want to think what doesn't exist that I wish did exist, right? Because you can create anything. So I, you know, I love children's books and I have three kids and I read tons of books to them, you know, when they were growing up and I don't re ever remember a book about this particular subject. And because I'd had the personal experience, I thought oh, maybe I can come up with a story. And then, and then it is kind of thinking, well, is that, a, is this enough for a book, right? Mm -hmm. Is this good? Is there enough material there? So what are the ups and downs and the surprises and the, the backstory? What are the what are the things that are going to fill the story out? So so really, before I ever start trying to come up with rhymes or any of that stuff, you know, it really is is mapping out okay. the story from from, you know. A so you don't just think in rhyme because <laughs> no, your rhymes are on point. Oh. Well, well, thank you. That is something I pride myself. I'm very like um, strict with myself about it scanning correctly. You yeah. know, uh, I, you know, Dr. Seuss obviously is, is the, uh, my role model and the, the guide for all of that. So I always want to make sure that it's never forced, you know, that it mm -hmm. flows naturally, right. With the accent on the right word and, and, and searching for rhymes. It's always, it's something that's come naturally to me, but it's still, you know, it's it's a lot of work because you, you've got, especially a children's book, you've got limited space, you know, a limited story yeah. to tell. So every word counts. Every, yes, every so word matters. make sure that every word counts and that nothing's wasted because you have so few of them. Yeah. Um. So is that, a, is that an unsent, do we click on it? On unsent. Oh. I oh, I did. Oh, I just did, and that's it. Are there any yeah. more questions? So my favorite color. Now that you ask, I'm joking. <laughs> um, let's see. So how many, like, how many books do you illustrate in a year, Gladys? That's oh, that's a question. Um, this is the wrong year to ask because I'm overloaded. This is the right year to ask. No, it's it's so it's not an average year is what I oh, mean. Right. Um so on average it's probably like four to five, but then COVID kind of pushed things back and then everything's just kind of um so right now I'm working on like seven, eight for this year, but that's not typical. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. But yeah. that's Congratulations. Thank you. 2022 is going to, it's going to be pretty interesting and exciting. Yeah. I mean, mean, like Clay, have lots of books coming out next year. Yeah. I mean, Clayton was like my 2021, like baby though. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it was so the only one that like was able to like the Abrams pushed it through and made everything work out, which was really exciting. Cause I like after finishing it last year, I would have been so anxious just waiting to like, actually hold it yeah. yeah isn't that fun you get the box full of all those books this yeah is really, this is really my first time for this i did you know in despicable me there's a, a book called sleepy kittens that grew mm -hmm. reads to the girls and so i i'm the one who wrote that and that's like a little rhyming book and then they actually made a book so mm -hmm. so i've had that before but this is really my first oh wait we have another question Ooh. Cinco, can you talk about creating some of your iconic characters? Gru, Bubble Boy. <laughs> Those are, yeah, Gru and Bubble Boy are the, the big ones. Um, yeah, I mean, Gru, it is really interesting to make the lead character in your movie a villain, right? To take who's usually the villain, the bad guy, and, oh, let's make this character the hero. So he has to be a villain and bad in some ways, but he can't be too bad because mm -hmm. otherwise you won't like him. You won't root for him, you know? So we, there was a term that we used called deliciously evil. So it's sort of like, let's make Gru deliciously evil. So he'll be evil in the way that we wish we could be. Like if we're in a long line somewhere, right. And he can just yeah. freeze everybody and go to the front of the line. And, 
just to push everyone back. Yeah, yeah. Or if someone's like parked in your parking space and you can just push, you know, have a car that can smash them aside. So, so that was a big part of it. But then also, you know, there are flashbacks in the first movie of Gru with his mom, right? And sh mm -hmm. showing that his villainy kind of came from the fact that he never got enough love from his mom. Yeah. And for that, it's, that's always a good way to create sympathy for a character, show them when they were a child and show how they, you know, even if they're sort of a rotten person, you can see, oh, but here's why. There was childhood trauma there. I've never, I've seen, I don't know how many times I've seen it and I've never like connected it that deeply. Like I've seen it and I'm like, oh, okay, I can understand yeah. it. But yeah, like you, you pretty much showed his childhood trauma in a very kid friendly way right but just that he could never get any approval from his mom right mm -hmm. and so so even like gladys you know you didn't consciously feel it but you kind of subconsciously feel it right it creates yeah. empathy for, for the character who's uh a bad guy and then i can talk a little bit about the girls margot edith and agnes which are really i think a lot of the heart of the the movie's belongs to them, specifically Agnes, who's my favorite, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to really distinguish the girls. So Margo, the oldest, they are kind of like super ego, ego and id in a way, you know? And so so Margo's the responsible one and she's kind of had to take on the mom role. Mm -hmm. And so then Edith is sort of just the wild animal, you know, she's just all about fun and doing what, whatever she f feels like doing she just does it and then agnes is just sweet and cute mm -hmm. and, and she's a you know a, a true little kid and and uh yeah and they're all based on different aspects of my own three kids i had mm -hmm. do you do you um do you put like family members in your books sometimes um I do, but not at, like in any real role. Like I think in Fresh Princess, I added my husband, myself, and my daughter um, looking out from a window. Ah. Oh, but funny. like it's really hard to to see. Um, <laughs> but it was just like it, like one of those like little signatures that I wanted to add. That's cute, little Easter egg. Yeah. For your family. I think we have another question. Yeah. Why did both of you gravitate towards animation cartoons? Like this style of drawing, what, what, right? Okay. Children's books, I guess. Yeah. So I've always been a child at heart and I went to university with the intention of becoming a graphic designer and working at an advertisement place and everything. And I realized that it wasn't really fun or for me. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just wasn't like I didn't, I didn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. Um, so I just started, I think it was a month right before graduating that like getting my diploma and everything that I told my mom that I was now going to be a children's book illustrator. Hmm. So um, what well, gravitated and in short, I just needed to breathe and um, kind of be that child that like bring to life that child in my heart and keep her alive via art. Cause you know how like normally they say that um, children lose their creativity when they grow up. I just didn't want to grow up. So um, kind of just found my home here and here's where I am. Nice. And what, yeah. um, I what led you either. What? Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to? So what led you to, um, um, become this amazing screenwriter and um, do, cause you're working on a wide range of stuff. It's not just the like children's audience. Now you're doing the musicals. I mean, yeah, you off I, musical, but. yeah, it sort of was kind of happenstance. I mean, when I first started making movies when I was a kid, you know, mm -hmm. the first ones I made were animated like with little clay monsters and stuff. And I did stop motion mm -hmm. animation. So, in some ways I got my start there, but I was really interested in comedy. So that was mostly what I was writing. But then it was really an invitation 
by uh, Chris Melodondry, who was at Fox and want, was looking for someone to write Horton Hears a Who, the movie. And he really liked a script my writing partner Ken and I had written. And so he pulled us into that world. And, you know, it was a really good experience. And Dr. Seuss's widow worked with us. And, and she awesome. ultimately really loved the movie. And so, and it was a success. And so then Chris formed his own company, Illumination, and said, do you guys want to come write all the movies? And I said, he said, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. And so I think I was there for, Ken and I were there for 10 to 12 years, you know, and, and writing all three Despicable Me's and then the Lorax also and Secret Life of Pets. And it, it just became like a home to mm -hmm. us. Yes. But, but, but in some ways I got to the point, like you mentioned, where I couldn't breathe there, yeah. you know, it's sort of like too much. I'd done too much of that and I really wanted to do live action yeah. Get out of animation. And also I, I've always wanted to do a musical and get to write songs, you know? And, yeah. and so that's what led to Schmigadoon, which is kind of the next phase three or whatever you call yeah. it of the career. But it's but it but you just don't ever want to get stagnant, right? And so yeah. I was feeling I was kind of stagnant and I want there were other things that I wanted to do. And that's, it, that's fair and awesome that you were able to, because there's some people that will allow themselves to just stay in one place. And it's awesome that you, you know, jumped from one, like 12 years, you said? Yeah. Yeah, yeah 12 years and you're like, okay, I, I'm, I, like, I'm sure that maybe if they, uh, if in the future something came up that you felt creatively connected to, but it's awesome that you were able to, recognize that and like create you know these musicals and these amazing songs by the way um so thank you for that thank oh. you for that decision yeah and this and the book is another part of that right mm -hmm. well let's let's flex a different muscle which i got to yeah. flex a little bit with horton and the lorax because i would write seuss-like narration but, uh, yeah oh it looks like we have another question should i see we what do. they say what do you both do when you have a creative block, writer's block or artist's block? I cry. Do you cry? <laughs> no, oh. no, no. Oh, no, I don't cry. Um, I have worked my creative drawing muscles enough to where I don't get much of a block knock on wood. Yeah. Um, but writing, because I've been wanting to write for a while, um, I've been blocked there, you know. So for me, creatively in general, I guess I walk away, disconnect myself enough from what I'm working on. And um, I'm not hard on myself. I don't blame myself for not being creative. It's understandable and we all go through it or in some aspects for the writing. I spent a year trying to write something and feeling very frustrated. And I think once I just said, okay, I'm not going to force it. Um, about like half a year later, I started coming up with ideas again. Mm. So it's just really allowing yourself to breathe and to not have a perfect winding creative gear going. Cause it's not always gonna, you know, yeah, that's that's the key for me, which is it's it's not it's not something I've really struggled with because I, I will just say, well, I'm going to write today and it may just all be bad. Mm -hmm. I may throw it all out, but I'm still going to do it just to write because I feel like I should write every day. Mm -hmm. and so I do it, but you have to go into it with realizing that, well, it could just be all bad. Yeah. But guess what? You can throw it out or you can fix it. There's like, there's tons of possibilities. So the worst thing you can do is say, I'm not going to write unless it's perfect. And I think that, yeah. that causes writer's block often. So, so if anyone's struggling with that, I would try to get that thought out of your head because that's, that's the, that's sort of an anti-creative mm -hmm. idea that it's like, unless it's perfect, I'm not going to. I, yeah. with the writing, now that you're mentioning that, um, I had a block in the summer of, it was after my daughter was born, so the summer of 2016, 
Um, and I gave myself this random crazy challenge where I had to draw a hundred little drawings every day, oh. every day, um, and create some sort of story within that image. So, um, Cinco, what you're saying about like just being consistent and I went in knowing that maybe one day the story wouldn't be funny, the illustration, Yeah. but it was just having something done. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's just one day or even if it's a week, whatever it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't, don't do a drawing every day. That was extra. That sounds, that sounds like, but it was the, it was the key, right? That was the yeah. Key. Yeah. I wasn't working as much at the time, um, so I had free time. Right. So. That helps. Um, any other questions? Thoughts? Concerns? Mm -hmm. Ideas? Um, i trying to think if I have any other questions for Do you. No, I have a question actually. Do you have any non Clayton Parker stories in mind? Oh, Just um, like something. Yeah, I have. I have this other uh, idea that that I've been playing with for a while. That was based on something my daughter said when she was really little. She had an idea about a girl who puts her hand on a rainbow and then gets rainbow hand. Oh. And, like, then everything she touches turns to rainbow colors. Yeah. And so I kind of, uh, I've been working on on something based on that. Oh. But I'd also That's love cute. to like, at some point, a phase of my career, like write a young adult novel or something, but I don't know. It's a very different style of writing from screenwriting. So yeah, it might be too tough for me to do, but. I mean, so that creative block that I was in, I was trying to write picture books and I actually ended up writing a short, like early reader chapter book. Hmm. So you might be able to transition, like work your way to the YA. Oh yeah, could do a chapter book next and then work my way to a Yeah, novel. just to kind of like get get that, that those, those new gears going. Yeah, oil the gears. Yeah. Um, I wonder if Clayton Parker really, really, really has to pee could become an animated movie. Could we stretch that story out to, to 90 minutes, Gladys? That Was would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> there would have to be more twists and turns than are in the current book. I but think... I've taken picture books and turned them into 90 minute movies before. So maybe it'll, yeah. There's a there's a good challenge there, because imagine if the the story wasn't necessarily based on Clayton, but on the organs and the bladder. Oh yeah. Too. So it's like that. That could be like a whole arc of the movie. With that's like, one of my favorite pages in the illustrations is is your your kidneys and that was stomach and bladder. And I did the research uh, to make sure that I was medically sound. Yeah on this part of the book. Yeah, that was, um, cause in the writing, I, cause at first I was looking at it, I'm like, how am I going, cause in the writing it's saying that they're sending a message from the kidney to the brain. And I was like, how am I going to depict this while showing Clayton? Oh, cause right. I could have stayed in the Clayton world, but um, I'm like, no, let's see what the organs would look like. And they were cute and they're my favorite. And fun it's fact, really I, I I only have one kidney, so getting to draw two kidneys, I, I was almost almost tempted to make it a one kidney like ah. person to show like body diversity. Um, <laughs> but I, I drew the two. Yeah. I have a biased opinion about two kidneys. Oh, no. yeah. I'm sorry. I have two, I, yeah. but I'm not going to lord it over you. <laughs> um but yeah so like drawing it out like i was looking at all the the pictures and I, i've looked at you know organs and stuff myself so it was just very it was fun just characterizing them and i don't know if you actually looked um like i made let me see the bowel he looks irritated oh, get it that's appropriate. So, yeah yeah 
Um, he does look irritated, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted him to be a bit irritated because of the whole, and then the stomach is looking like he's aching. So um, yeah. I had a little bit too much fun. I, I think I was in the in my studio that day laughing to myself. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because it was just a little, I don't know. It, it's just, it's the small things, the small joys. The small joys. We have another question, Gladys. <laughs> It's how long does it take to create a kid's book? Um. So it was interesting for me that I wrote that, you know, I can't even remember how long it took me to write it, but much shorter than it took you to illustrate it, I'm sure. And then yeah. I remember once they said that you were going to be the illustrator, and I said, heck yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. But then it was it it was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. How long did it take? And not not based on like you're slow or anything. It's just the oh, publishing process is slow, right? That's just literally how all everything is. I'm curious how many um how many months before I was contacted were you already working on it? Because I know for me, I worked on it from. I'm trying to map it out eight months and then probably a year to publish. So right. 12, 12, like it was like 20 months. Yeah, and this is, it's probably gonna be obnoxious, but it, I sort of, I wrote this book over the course of a month, mm -hmm. you know, while I was working on other stuff. So I'd come back, you know, it was sort mm -hmm. of like at my day job, which is writing movies and then I'd go home and then at night I, you know, sort of work, work on Clayton Parker. But mm -hmm. then of course you, you submit it to, to various publishers and then you find somebody who chooses it, but then you're working with an editor and they're, they're making suggestions, right? So yeah. some, some things like, um, I don't think the part about the bird, right? The ostrich, that was in my original draft, but they were yeah. suggesting like, hmm, can we find other attempts, you know, he makes. So, so that was a process that went over several months, right? Which yeah. is revising and, and re rewriting it. Yeah, so it takes, we can say probably two years, one yeah. year to two years. Yeah. yeah, it's about two years. Yeah, That's wild. I mean, we experienced it and even still, like now being at the end of it, I still like, I feel like it was just yesterday that I got the manuscript. Ah. Um. So yeah, two years. Two years. Yeah, I remember thinking, how long can, once you have the illustrations, how long can it be to print up all these books? I'm Does saying, take that's so what I said. I'm like, don't you guys have a printer in the building? I'm joking, Abrams. I know you don't, <laughs> but they should. I'm joking. But Is, is Abrams watching us? Probably. I don't know. I don't know. We should be careful. Are, um, <laughs> are, there, are there any more questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all. It's also fine if there aren't. No one needs yeah. to feel pressure or feel bad because they don't have a question. Yeah, I mean, feel the pressure, you guys. Ask. I, mean, I guess my question for you in the audience would be, like, like what would Clayton's next adventure be? Right? What would what would you like to, you know, Clayton's well, uh, situation, his circumstance be next time? I think you'd want to follow the pattern of Clayton Parker really, really, really has to blank. Yeah. I feel like it's in, in that zone. There's one of my daughters suggested, but she'll never forgive me if I say it out loud. So I'm not going to say it. Okay. Um, but it would, it would be funny, but no, I don't know. Is it um, perhaps another bodily function? Yeah, it would follow, you know how this one was book number one. Right. So that so one would, that would be, be number two? Yeah. Yeah. So that was my five-year-old daughter's suggestion. Cause she's like, oh now, now he has to. Yeah. And I was like, oh god. It's a whole <laughs> series of educational books. Yeah. My my daughter, uh, one of my daughters teaches fifth grade, and mm -hmm. she Put the book in her classroom and then recently she showed me a picture of a fifth grader a fifth grader reading the book to a first grader oh cutest thing That's i've ever seen yeah. yeah um another idea is 
Clayton Parker. Well, I don't know because that's not there's it's not it wouldn't be a bodily fluid type. Oh, okay. No, never mind. So it's gonna say really oh, Clayton Parker really has to do his homework, and it's like talking about procrastination, which is still the same. Oh. So instead of it being geared on bodily functions, it's maybe the the Clayton's issue is just procrastination. Right. Oh, that right. Exactly. If you put something off, this is what's going to happen. All yeah. right, Maggie's here like, shut this down. No. <laughs> shut this down. No. We want another hour. I'm um, Well, maybe a good one would be Clayton Parker really needs to cry. Because, you know, oh. when you're in that situation where, like, you really need to cry, but you can't because you're in public. But about, you know, like, um, I guess masculinity and childhood and, like, you right. know. It's like, no, oh, boys thing. don't cry or something like that. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like, no, he oh. really needs to. He's, that's, yeah. a, that's a good <laughs> idea. I was also thinking Clayton Parker really, really, really has to laugh. Yes. He's, he's in church or he's at a funeral or something. So and, inappropriate like, moment. How do I, I you know? Yeah. I hope these Clayton Parker's books, I mean, I have no control over this, but I hope they continue because they're so good. And I wish I had something like that when I was a kid. You know, mm -hmm. like explaining these things you like can't explain to other people, mm -hmm. um, especially like, and your parents would be like, "Shut up!" You know, <laughs> I yeah. had great parents, but yeah. still, like, I remember sitting in synagogue and like a three-hour service in like Rosh Hashanah, and my parents were like, "You're not going to the bathroom." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We just know you're going to go in there and eat cookies. <laughs> like, yeah, it's the worst friend. experience. Or on a long car ride, I remember yes. like we would go on long car rides. Like we would drive everywhere. You know. Vacation was always driving when I was growing up. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, so you have to wait till we find a rest stop. Yeah. And with, um, I used to take the bus to school and I was the very last stop at the end of the day. The uh, very. Mm -hmm. So that scene where he's like going, to, like, I've experienced that. And yeah. Just having to wait on the bus and every stop. And then they take the other kids take forever to get off of the bus. Yeah. So it's very relatable. Yeah. Well, the great thing about these books, too, is that there's built in tension, you know, <laughs> like there it is. That's like the. <laughs> you know, I, mean, you I don't I don't think know, that there's uh, much yeah. there. There. Yeah, there are very few tensions that are universal. Yeah. yeah. And I think this one is. <laughs> yeah. Which is why these books are so good. Thank Let's you hope so it much. sells a million copies and Abrams will say, please, Cinco Gladys. <laughs> We Give us really, really, book. really want another book. Yeah. I will advocate. Book Soup will advocate. These are great books that are not only funny, but also can really, really help kids and maybe even adults. Because, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, or the, the adults of um, children who are potty training. Because yeah, I just yeah. went through that, too. And using this book as kind of like that, that example, like, this is what happens. You need to go. Right, yeah. <laughs> or even women who've just had babies or whatever, like, and every time we sneeze, we're just like, we pee ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you both so much. Um, if, would you like to give a little outro or I could continue wrapping up our presentation? Um, you can just wrap up. I just mm -hmm. thank everybody for, for watching and, and for buying the book and, uh, we, and thanks to Book Soup for having us. It's been thank really you. nice. Great, thank you. Um, that's a wrap on our presentation. Thank you again to all of our guests and everyone who tuned in this afternoon. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your per, uh, support of independent bookstores. Support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Um, just click on the green purchase button that reads Clayton Parker really, really has to pee directly below the viewer screen. Uh, if you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Have a great day, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye.